Happy Easter! Yay. All right, let's go. It's good to be here this morning. Hey, I got to bring some energy. It's the third time for us. We're excited to have you here. Thank you so much for spending your Easter with us. For those joining us online, we are thankful to have you tuning in today. We are celebrating the greatest day in history, the day where Jesus rose from the grave. And we are so excited to celebrate that this morning. And today I want to talk about the difference that it makes in our lives because so many people say they believe in the resurrection, but they have no idea how it can change their life. A recent LifeWay research poll found that two thirds, 66% of all Americans say they believe in the resurrection. And in that poll, they also found that those who go to church at least once a month, that number goes up to 89% of people who go to church believe in the resurrection. But again, I would say a lot of people have no idea how it can change their life. This was an event that took place almost 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, and everybody in Jerusalem knew about it. The word spread through the Roman Empire about what had happened. And if it were to happen today, if it would have been today, we know that with all of the news outlets and social media, it would have been broadcast everywhere, and everybody would know about it. But back then... Of course, they didn't have that, but they had word of mouth. And it started in Jerusalem, about 15 different references to Jesus being alive after he had been dead. He appeared to more than 515 different people. The accounts began to spread. Jesus was teaching. He was talking. He was healing. He was making breakfast for his friends. He was alive. But the question today is, what impact does that have on your life and my life in 2024? I want to give you four ways that Easter changes everything for us today. Number one is this. Easter changes our despair into hope. Despair into hope. Now those who were close followers of Jesus were going through an extremely sad time in their lives. Just imagine being one of the 12 or one of the larger group that went with Jesus everywhere. They followed Jesus. And what a difference a few days make because just the Sunday before, Jesus had come into Jerusalem. It was a triumphal entry. People were praising him as their king. They were waving palm branches at him, and it was amazing. But in a matter of a few days, as we looked at Friday when we had our Good Friday service, everything began to change. Jesus was betrayed, he was arrested, he was beaten, he was taken, he was crucified. The most horrible scene that you can imagine. Imagine the despair of those closest to Jesus. Three and a half years, is it just all going down the drain right now? All of our hopes and dreams are just gone? You know, in 2024, most of us in this room, if you've been alive for a while, you've had some hopes and dreams that maybe have fizzled. You've had maybe a business you started, a career you thought was going to take off. Maybe it was your education. Maybe it was a sport that you were into. Something in your life where you had maybe a relationship, a dream of what it was going to be, and it didn't turn out the way you hoped. And there are feelings of despair that we all experience in our lives. Mary and Martha, these close friends of Jesus, they went to the grave that Sunday morning in sadness and in despair, they went for the purpose of treating the body of Jesus with spices, which was the tradition of that day. Suddenly, everything changed. John chapter 20, beginning with verse number one. 
For those of you that have been here, you know that we've been in a series called According to His Best Friend. And we've been studying the life of Jesus according to his best friend, which was John. And John wrote this. He said, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and she found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. That's how John referred to himself. Isn't that cool, right? All right. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. She was distraught. Well, verses 3 through 10 describe a foot race between Peter and John to get to the grave. They were like, we got to see this for ourselves. And they go and they find that the grave is empty and there are the clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in that were laying there and the body was gone. And immediately they began to realize, oh, wait a minute. Jesus told us that he was going to come back to life. But as we read in the story, Mary didn't understand yet what had happened. And in verse 11, the story continues for Mary. It says, she was standing outside the tomb and she was crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in and she saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other sitting at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave, and she saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? And she thought that he was the gardener. And she said, sir, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him. I'll go and get him. And then Jesus, in a voice that Mary recognized, he said her name, Mary. And she turned to him, and she cried out, Rabbanai which in Hebrew means teacher. And Jesus said, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and she told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. See, despair is something that I think we all experience at times. The lack of hope, that feeling of doom and gloom, that negative outlook on life. But I want to tell you today, Easter changes everything. Easter changes our despair into hope because Jesus defeated death. Now, death is the thing that can take us lower than anything else in our lives. Some of you in the last months or year have experienced the death of a loved one. You've walked through that, and it's hard. There's no way around that. There's nothing harder than dealing with the loss of someone you love. It's on your mind. And no matter who you are, it's difficult because it feels so final. But as I sit with people and we have conversations as they're going through that pain of losing someone, I can't tell you how many times people have told me, I don't know how anybody could go through this without knowing the Lord, without knowing Jesus, without having hope beyond the grave. If this is all there is, there's not a lot of hope. But because Jesus rose from the grave, we have hope of life after death because Jesus conquered death. And when we go through times of mourning, despair, and discouragement, we can always remember this is temporary pain. This is temporary. Jesus has overcome. The resurrection proves it. We have hope of life after death And that Jesus rose from the dead means it's not just for him, it's for us. And we should never live as people without hope because we have a Savior who's alive and well. So number one, Easter changes our despair into hope. Number two, Easter changes our doubt into belief. Doubt. Some of you have come in this room today, and if you were to be honest, you have doubts. You have doubts maybe about the resurrection or about God or about the Bible, And I want you to know you're in the right place. We welcome you. Bring your doubts to the Lord. It's okay. You can have doubts. You should examine your doubts. There was a disciple that got a kind of a mean nickname, I think. We call him Doubting Thomas now. I don't want to be called Doubting Steve. That would be kind of rough, right, to have that attached to your name. He was called Doubting Thomas. And some of you know the story of what happened, but I can kind of understand him. I can kind of relate to him. Anybody in the room that's a math and science person, you kind of know, like, 
you want evidence? Like, I'm not going to believe. Like, Thomas was there. He saw the crucifixion. He saw the excruciating suffering of Jesus with nails in his hands and his feet, his side being pierced. He was dead. Thomas saw it. Don't tell me he's alive. How could that be? With what he went through, there's no way. He wanted proof. I'm that kind of person too. Like, I want proof. Sometimes people come to me and tell me something that seems kind of hard to believe. I'm like, no, I don't believe it. I need to see more. Thomas struggled to have faith. And then we read John chapter 20, verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. So they were all gathered. Jesus came, and Thomas wasn't there. And they told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. So eight days later, the disciples were together again in this room, and Thomas was there this time. The doors were locked. There was no way in, except suddenly Jesus is just standing there among them, and he says, peace be with you. Just came right through the wall. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. I say to you this morning on Easter Sunday, don't be afraid of your doubts. Explore them. Understand them. Guess what? God can handle them. He's not mad at you for having doubts. He's not mad at you for having questions. And so often those who are struggling the most with their doubts are the ones that are closest to coming to that place of belief. So I invite you, study their evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I know many people who have turned from doubters into believers because they've studied the evidence. So what evidence? Well, we have the empty tomb. That's a bit of evidence. Some people have tried to say, well, maybe they all went to the wrong tomb. Yeah, they were all just that dumb. <laughs> Nobody could point it out that that was the wrong tomb. No, that's, that, that's been debunked. But there's other stories that people have told. But there's 515 plus eyewitnesses. And the greatest evidence to me for the resurrection is the changed lives of the disciples. I've never known anybody that's been willing to die for something they would know was a lie. Some people try to say, well, the disciples, maybe they stole the body of Jesus and hid it somewhere so they could go around saying that the guy they followed was alive. Yeah, that's a great story until it comes to the point where 11 out of the 12 of them are dying as martyrs, holding on to that truth that they believe Jesus is alive. Who would die willingly for something they knew was not true? Their lives were changed. Remember this, Easter changes everything. If Jesus can overcome death, he can certainly help you overcome your doubts or whatever else you're facing in your life today. Don't be afraid to bring your doubts to God. Easter changes everything. It turns our despair into hope. It turns our doubt into belief. Easter changes our fear into confidence. The disciples were so fearful. When Jesus was arrested, they became cowards. They were scattered. They were scared for their lives. And in fear of his life, remember Peter? We talked about Peter on Friday night. Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. So I, I don't know him. Why? He was afraid he could get arrested and he could die. Peter denied Jesus three times. Guess what happened? After the resurrection, Peter went from being a fearful coward to a bold preacher. It's amazing what happened. The resurrection can take us beyond our fear. So Jesus, he spent 40 days on the earth after his resurrection. And you look into the words of Jesus, the final words, before he ascends up into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus speaking to the disciples. He said, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, here in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jesus gave the disciples an assignment, 
Spread the gospel message to the world. Yes, you men who were cowards, who were hiding, who were denying me, who were scattered 42 days ago, you've got this. I believe in you. It's up to you. This mission is on you. Guess what? They stepped up. They had confidence. They fulfilled that mission. You know how I know? We're here today. What the resurrection can do for us is take the fears that we have inside of us and it can make us become a force for the kingdom of God. Some of you coming in today, you have fear. Look at what happened to Peter. Peter began boldly preaching. Jesus ascended into heaven and then in Acts chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost. Thousands upon thousands of people are gathered in Jerusalem. Peter steps up and he preaches for the first time. Without formal training, he had just been with Jesus for three and a half years, and he begins preaching. And he says to the crowd of people, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now Jesus is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see in here today. So Peter continues, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, in parentheses, whom you crucified, he has made him to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And imagine in the middle of the sermon, they say, hey, hey, what should we do? What should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins. Turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, and those who believed what Peter said were baptized. They were added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Not bad for the first sermon he ever preached. I think Peter has a chance to make it in the ministry. What an amazing event that took place. It was a victory. Guess what? When you have a victory, when your fear turns into confidence and you have a victory and you stack that on another victory, you start building confidence. The next time Peter preached, 5,000 people were saved. I mean, the church just took off all over the area. Why? Because they had confidence. They believed that they would win in your life, all of us in this room, in your personal journey with God. What are you fearful of? What are you afraid of? What are the next steps for you to become part of the force for the kingdom of God? Like, this message is for you. Easter, it changes you from a person of fear to a person of confidence. For some of you, you have a fear of baptism, like you've never been baptized. As I look around this room, I see people that I remember their baptism. Some of you, though, it's like, I'm afraid of taking that step of going public with my faith. And listen, I would encourage you, take that next step. We have our next baptism coming up in June. For some of you, it's a fear of involvement. Like if I get involved in the church in a small group or, or serving, you know, people will get to know me and I'm awkward. You know, I'm not good enough. What if I get rejected? There's all these fears. There's the fear that some of you have of sharing your faith with others, like telling other people what you believe. i not eloquent. I don't know how to say things the right way. I don't have Bible verses memorized. What if people reject me? What if they cancel me? Lots of doubts, lots of questions. But remember this, Easter changes everything. And that includes transforming our fears into confidence. That's what it does for us. Jesus rose from the dead to help us overcome our fears, to step out and become part of the force for the kingdom of God. He wants you to make that change in your life. But let me close by talking about the most important change that Easter can make in your life. Easter can change your eternal destiny. Because of Easter, we can move from a place of uncertainty to a place of certainty about our future, to a place of not knowing, to a place of having assurance of eternity in heaven with God. I want you to check out the words of Jesus. Last Sunday in our series, Mitch preached about the story of Lazarus, a friend of Jesus who had been dead for four days, Jesus shows up on the scene and people are weeping, people are sad and Jesus speaks to his friends in John 11 verse 25. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Before he had even died, he was talking about being the resurrection and the life. And the way to live after you die is by believing in Jesus. Jesus is addressing a universal problem. We all have it. We're all going to die. I mean, Lazarus had it twice. He died twice. But we all have that problem. I think only a fool would go through life unprepared for something that he knows is inevitable. If we know it's inevitable, we should be prepared for it. Nobody wants to sit around and talk about death, right? Like, I don't really want to do that. But the fact is, every one of us have a deep internal longing to know. Like, what is going to happen when I die, when I breathe my last breath? It's obvious we're going to spend more time on the other side of eternity. So we should be prepared for that. We want to stand before God prepared. In heaven, the Bible describes it as a perfect place, perfect peace, perfect joy, everything, complete perfection, no sin, no error, nothing bad at all in heaven. Being a perfect place, it's a place we want to get into, but we're not perfect. If God let us in the way we are, we would mess up heaven. So what happened? God sent Jesus. God had a beautiful plan of his love for us, of sending his son Jesus to be the ultimate sacrifice. See, Jesus lived a perfect life. He was sinless. So when he died on the cross, he could take our sin on himself and be our substitute, be our sacrifice. And by believing in him, we receive his righteousness on us, and God sees us as perfect. In John 17, Jesus said, this is the way to have eternal life. He doesn't say this is a way. He says this is the way to have eternal life, by knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one he sent to earth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, a lot of people try to achieve salvation. They think, I can get into heaven just by being sincere. I don't have to believe everything Jesus said or the Bible says. I just got to be sincere about whatever I feel or think. The Bible doesn't say that. Jesus didn't say that. Sometimes people think, well, if I'm just a really good person, like there's a scale in heaven, all the good deeds I do here, all the bad here, if if it tips in the good, I'm good. I'm better than other people. God will let me in. You know, I go to church. I've done some of the rituals, baptism, communion, confession. The Bible doesn't say that gets you into heaven. Jesus didn't say that. Sometimes people think, well, I'm going to, you know, inherit my salvation. My mom and dad, they were Christian. My grandparents were Christian, so I'm automatically a Christian. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Jesus said. And I'm going to go with what Jesus said because he is the only one that rose from the dead that defeated death. So what Jesus said matters most. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Having hope means you don't have anything to fear. We don't have to fear death anymore. I'm sure... For many, the the process is still scary of of dying, but we don't have to fear what is beyond death. How can you be not afraid of dying? By making peace with God. You don't have to leave this room this morning without having peace with God. Everybody maybe came for a different reason today. Some of you came because you come every week. Some of you came because it's Easter. Easter. Some of you came because you rode by, saw our sign, and thought, I'll check out that church. Some of you were dragged here by your spouse or your mom or dad. But I don't believe anybody's here by accident. I believe God wants you here right now for this reason, so that you can know that Easter can change your life. The resurrection can transform your life. What happened a couple thousand years ago is so relevant in your life today. Easter can change feelings of despair, and to hope. It can change people who are in this room that are doubters into believers. It can change some of you in this room who are believers but are fearful. It can change you into people of confidence. You can become a force for the kingdom of God. But I close by saying this. There's some of you in the room this morning. Easter can change your destiny today. You can leave this place today knowing that you're on the path to heaven that you're in his hand, that you're a follower, a believer in Jesus, and that when you die, you'll be with him in heaven for eternity. Would you bow your heads with me? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. 
The band's going to come back. We're going to have a closing song in a moment. But before we do, as you're seated here in this room with your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe the Lord's been speaking to you during this message, during the music today, and, and you might believe in the resurrection, but you've never really put your faith in Jesus for your salvation for eternity. In this moment right now, I want to give you the opportunity to do what 30 to 40 people have done in the first two services, of putting your faith in Jesus. See, I don't know what what that means or how to do that. Listen, let me just lead you in a very simple prayer to pray in your heart. And it's not my words. It's what's happening between you and the Lord in your conversation with God right now. You just say something to him like this. Say, dear God, thank you so much for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to this earth to die for me on the cross. Please forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my life today. I am confessing my belief in you and that you died and you rose again to have eternal life for me. And I I receive that, that gift of eternal life today. Thank you, God, that one day when I die, I will be in heaven with you and I am trusting you now for that. Thank you for saving me with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just prayed that simple prayer with me this morning, let me just ask you to do something kind of bold, something that I've said 30 to 40 people have done in the first two services. Would you acknowledge that you just prayed that prayer to the Lord this morning and you've asked him to save you, to give you a home in heaven? Would you acknowledge that in this moment with nobody looking around except for me? Would you just slip your hand up and say, I just prayed that prayer with you, Steve. I just prayed with you. Hands all over the room. You're not alone. There's probably about 15 to 20 people with their hands raised this morning. Is there anybody else? Say, Steve, I did. I prayed that with you. I'm not ashamed. Thank you. God, I just am so humbled this morning. Today, God, what you're doing here in our church on Easter Sunday. Lord, we thank you for all of those who are committing their life to you. For all those who are having their destiny changed. And Lord, they're secure in their faith. And they know that one day they'll be in heaven with you. Lord, we're so thankful for that. Lord, help us now as we go from this place in a few moments to live out our faith, to celebrate the fact that we're alive in you, that you are alive in us, that you are our living hope. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for this time together on Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.